<laughs> Hi, um, as you heard, my name is Carrie Snyder. I recently uh, just finished up working for the Roscoe Bartlett campaign, running his victory office in Montgomery County. I see a lot of uh, the volunteers that helped me out during a very stressful and a very hard campaign. And uh, and uh, wanted me just to say a couple words just about my opinion on grassroots organizing. And basically, what it comes down to is where you want to spend your precious and very, very, very scarce volunteer hours. And uh, that's basically in the best ways that it is to win a campaign, which is direct voter contact. So you may think that like lots of things are, are more than they are, they really are, but the best way to to build your build your support, build your, you know, grassroots organization is to get people going on things that are going to be the most benefit. Oops. Um, so direct voter contact, knocking on doors, spending every day and intense Super Saturdays, uh, contacting as many people as possible uh, with the right message. So. Uh, to start off, we're going to start with Dan, and he and his wife Paula are self-employed owners of several successful small businesses, ranging from web solutions and design to support equipment. He is a former police officer from the New York City Police Department and a former member of the Elite Presidential Protection Division of the United States Secret Service. While working full-time for the New York City Police Department, he used and his accrued vacation time to attend the City University of New York where he completed both his bachelor's and master's degrees in psychology, concentrating in both neuropsychology and behavioral learning. Patrolling the streets of Brooklyn, New York, Dan saw firsthand the devastation of years of failed social policy and experimentation. He would never see the world the same way again after his experiences with the police department. During his tenure as a special agent with the Secret Service, Dan completed his second graduate degree, a master's of business administration at Penn State University where he tested at the top of his class. When Dan transferred to the Baltimore field office in 2010, he immediately made an impact on the community, breaking up one of the largest broad rings in Maryland's history. In 2012, Dan was a Republican candidate. He <laughs> candidate for U.S. Senate for the state of Maryland. And now, take it away, Dan Bongino. And the list goes on and on, the hours you spend to be out there in the heat and the cold fighting the good fight that has to be fought. And I don't mean the political fight, ladies and gentlemen, I mean the philosophical fight. Yes. Yes. We did not lose a philosophical fight. We may have lost a political battle. And I'm going to talk about some strategy going forward on how to win that, but the philosophical fight continues. This is the philosophical fight of our time. Make no mistake. Collectivism versus individualism. Every generation's had that battle. This is ours. It's never, ever going to stop. But I believe the purpose of the panel and the purpose here today is to talk about a path, a strategic path forward. How we actually win these political battles. Well, we have about eight minutes, is that right? Eight minutes. Okay. Oh, time. Give me that little elbow nudge. Because I don't want to take the seven again. When I'm doing an autopsy on, on my campaign, um, I found two major umbrella problems of which most of the political problems we have will fall in a subset of, of one of these two. Uh, I, I see them as the first one being get out the vote and voter registration, and the second one being message versus marketing, which I'm going to handle uh, last. First, big umbrella problem for the Republican Party, especially in Maryland. Get out the vote, voter registration. You know what the problem is? We're not doing it. Right. Folks, any of it, anywhere. Now, strategically moving forward, because I have limited time, there are a number of action items going forward. Everyone in this room uh, should be moving forward through their club or their activist group, because I'm looking around at some faces, and I know every one of you. <laughs> These are, this is the best of the best in here. 
are part of something that does something. If you're not registering voters at the gun shows in Maryland in the next two months, you should be arrested for political malpractice. You think people are a little upset about that right now? You think it may be the time to leverage that opportunity. Don't wait for the MDGOP to tell you to do it, because they won't. You do it. Get out there and do it. I will be up in Frederick, with Fred and the Frederick County Republican Club on the 26th doing just that. With a sign, not registered to vote? Want to keep your guns? <laughs> Folks, they're kicking our butts. Yes. The last 10 years, we've registered 100,000 Republicans. Terrific job, right? Yeah, the Democrats have registered 400,000. Bob Ehrlich won by 68,000 votes. They've registered nearly six times as many people. What are we doing? Not what are we talking about? What are we doing? Talk is cheap. You have to do. Do matters, not talk. Get out the vote. What are we doing to get out the vote? Not for me. The Senate campaign wasn't about me. These were philosophical fights. What are we doing to get Republicans out to vote? What is your club doing, action item, right now? They hit the undervote Republican. The 4,000 Garrett County, Garrett County, the most Republican county in the state, 4,000 plus Garrett County Republicans who didn't bother to vote. You hitting those doors? You talking to them? You better be. Because we have no chance if we don't turn out the 27% of the state that declares themselves a Republican. You have no chance. Secondly, because this is a broader topic, message versus marketing. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what the most dangerous branch of government is right now? The media. The media. You are damn right. <laughs> it's not the president. That's bad. It's the media allowing him to do what he does. Yes. Yeah. That's the problem. We are already in a supra-constitutional society, folks. People are all the constant. That's already been shredded. The question you should be asking now is how do we dial it back? And the answer is the message. The message is always, we don't have a message problem. Right. The president ran on our message. He did. I'm not going to raise taxes for middle class. Well, I'm going to cut the deficit. I'm strong on Israel. Really? <laughs> <laughs> These are real statements. That's our message, not his. And nobody in the media called him out, and they never, ever will. Right. So what do we do? Well, understand first, we don't have a message problem. We have a marketing problem. We have always had a marketing problem. What's the first action item? You better find an issue in your county. I have mine statewide right now, and I've run passionately on it. A lot of people didn't understand why. Now you may get it a little more. How are we not running statewide on this school choice issue? You guys have school choice. We're in a bad economy. No, no, we're not in a bad economy. Baltimore City is in a catastrophic economy. Yes. There is no economy in Baltimore City. How have we allowed, allowed this to happen? How have we allowed ourselves to be painted in a corner as misogynists and xenophobes without viciously fighting back? Folks, isolate and humiliate every one of our opponents who insists on chaining the doors behind one more black or Hispanic child in Baltimore City whose American dream is not yours. It is not. It is the civil rights issue of our day under a magnifying glass. And where was the TV commercial on the Romney campaign saying, love your public school? Blame the Democrats. Where was the picture of that union rep outside with the bullhorn ordering those young females, those black and Hispanic children who are in tough school districts, get back in that school? You don't get to pick that one. What, because they don't look like us or them? They get put in a box? That is our, you market that message that we will always stand for your liberty and your educational liberty. You have found a niche that you will crack wide open. And anyone who's campaigned with me in Baltimore City knows the conversation. Brandon's running around here somewhere. He has heard of the conversations I've had. I used to say all the time, don't you find it a bit inconvenient 
that Prince George's County is the wealthiest majority minority county in the entire country and has the second worst schools? That's not inconvenient for you? And don't you find it even more inconvenient that when you can pick the school, like the University of Maryland in Prince George's County, it's the best school in the state? Does that not bother you? That little item. I'll leave you with this thought because I, I'm, what do we got, five seconds? Okay. A minute, okay, great. <laughs> Folks, the philosophical fight goes on. We're in the echo chamber now. These are all wonderful men and women who have fought hard with me, right on my side. It's not enough. Action matters. And if you are not doing, you are not part of the problem, you are the problem. Yes. I'm sorry. is pure, unadulterated evil. And the low-information folks who don't understand it are apparatchiks in this unwillingly. And you are too if you're not doing anything. So just keep, you know, Timothy 4-7 in the back of your head, right? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I will keep the faith. And you will find it. said, so I'm not going to cover the same, the same ground, but I uh, give my second literally to his suggestions and his proposals, and I think we ought to be taking them seriously. Uh, first thing I want to talk to you about is opposition, opposition research. Um, it's very important to get very good, hard-hitting research on your candidate. Uh, in my district, we went after Chris Van Hollen's record uh, on Israel, we went on this record on national defense and national security. We also went after him on the deficit and things like that. But I put out a 16-page investigative newsletter on Van Hollen's record, and it embarrassed him. And it forced him to respond. And he didn't know what to do. He did not know what he did. This is the kind of thing that we need to do, that we can do, 
uh, you need to keep records on all of those Democrats in Congress and on our U.S. Senators and their voting records uh, so we can go after them in the future. As, as, by the way, I have copies if anybody wants this who doesn't have it. As minority candidates in Maryland, uh, we have to go on the attack. Uh, we can't go for half measures. Uh, we don't win by being nice, all right? Uh, so give, given the choice, given the choice, Democrats will not vote Democrat light. So we have to hit them hard. We have to stick to our guns and stick to our issues. All right. Uh, second, media. Dan mentioned uh, the media. I will just, as somebody who has worked in the media most of my life, I will tell you they are not our friend. The media is not our friend. Not a, not a uh, surprise to you. They will not cover our campaigns. All right. And when they do, they'll tell lies. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was at a um, non-debate with Chris Van Hollen in, a, in a, um, a synagogue in Montgomery County. And he was sitting out in the parking lot waiting to come in until I got off the stage. He sent a little note, which we happened to intercept, and we got it, we published it on my website later on. Van Hollen waiting until Timmerman gets off the stage until he'd come in to speak, because he wouldn't debate. We'd had one debate already, and he wasn't going to do it again. So he gets up there, and he, uh, this was at the time when um, uh, Todd uh, Aiken had made his stupid remarks uh, about uh, about abortion. And he comes up and says, "Well, Timmerman believes just like Aiken does, and he doesn't. Uh, he, he is pro-life, and he uh, doesn't uh, believe in any exceptions for rape, incest, or the life of the mother." And I, and I said, "You know, Chris, you know that's just not true." And he said, "Well, it's right here in the Montgomery Gazette." And he held up something that he had printed off the internet that morning, and clearly. The reporter who had done the story had tipped him off, and I hadn't seen it. Not, nobody on my team had seen it. And um, so I said, said Chris, well, you don't, you don't believe everything you read in the papers, do you? <laughs> he said, well, if you've got a problem with a gazette, you've got to take it up with them. Well, I did take it up with the gazette. I took it up with the executive editor of the gazette. I demanded a retraction. He put me on with a lying reporter. <laughs> Uh, invented those comments and simply had put words into my mouth when we were talking about my jobs plan. I had a 10-point jobs plan and he wanted to talk about abortion. I said, no, let's talk about jobs. He wanted to talk about social issues. Let's talk about 23 million unemployed people. Let's talk about all the uh, Marylanders in this district who are going to lose their jobs because of defense sequestration. No, no, let's talk about abortion. You're pro-life? I said, yes, of course I'm pro-life. Now let's talk about jobs. So he simply put words in my mouth. A day later, we got a retraction in writing, both in public on the website and in the public. We can't let them get away with anything. You've got to get them and you've got to go after them. Uh, third thing I want to mention just briefly, the state, the role of the state and county parties. Um, they didn't give me any assistance uh, to speak of. What I would really like and I think candidates need to get from them are, uh, especially from the state party. The state party should give us voter data, reliable voter data. And if the state spends on one thing, uh, they ought to invest in appending accurate emails and telephone numbers to the names that they've got in the databases. Because we had a terrible time trying to contact people using the voter databases that we had. Uh, we invested in Rocket Base. Uh, some of you may know about it. It's a great program, a lot of fun but way over-engineered for a congressional campaign. We need a ton of volunteers to be able to use it successfully. Uh, I think the state ought to be doing that kind of work for us. Um, some of you may know that I've uh, put in a number of public information requests to the state board of election about uh, voting uh, machine irregularities that were reported in Carroll County and Montgomery County. I can report to you today that we've had some results. Uh, we've had a number of meetings. Uh, Commissioner Richard Rothschild, who I think is still in the room, Rich. Uh, uh, Rich has been with me at uh, uh, two of these meetings, and I appreciate that greatly. Delegate Kathy Zali has come with me as well uh, to Carroll County. And uh, we found, uh, among other things, that it is uh, easy to introduce malicious software into these uh, electronic voting machines. Uh, I have full faith and confidence in the integrity of the local boards. I think we have volunteers who are working there who are really doing great work, and they need to be applauded, and I've said nice things to them at, at all of these meetings. But the system itself, the technology of the system itself, is not secure. 
Right. Now we did a little test in one machine. We heard, you know, we got specifics on anomalies with specific machines. So we got all the all of the individual voter authority cards, and Regis was with Regis was there with us as well. And uh, we called out all the Democrats, excuse me, all the independents who had voted on this one machine. There were 23 votes for me, 23 registered Republicans. So we said, well, let's call the uh, independents because clearly no independent voted for me, right? Well, uh, we got to uh, about half of the 28 independents who voted on that particular machine, five of them voted for me. That's 18%. When you take that against the Republican vote, that means that if that is accurate, I lost 22% of the Republican vote. So I submit to you, either uh, we are doing a really terrible job, worse than Dan even mentioned, of getting out the Republican vote, and some of us are losing 22% of the Republicans who actually vote, or we have a problem with voting machines. Very quickly, uh, I know I don't have too much time here and give you a big picture. Uh, we're losing America. We are losing America. They are organized. They've got an agenda. We conservatives define ourselves by negatives. Uh, we are, and I'm guilty of this just as other people are. Get government out of the way so businesses can create jobs. Don't grab our guns. Stop messing with our kids. Don't raise our taxes. Don't force gay marriages down our throat. Yes. And on and on and on and on. Soon, we're going to reach that time that Ronald Reagan envisaged when freedom is a memory, a fond story we tell our grandchildren in Australia. <laughs> They're riding the tiger, my friends. It's called change. And we're down on the grass, isolated, alone, where we can be picked off one by one. So what do we need to do? Organize. 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 Uh, we're up against the SEIU. We're up against the teachers' unions who bring mentally incompetent people to the polls. I can't tell you how many times I saw this uh, during early voting. It made me sick to my stomach, and there's nothing I could do about it. And they take absentee ballots into nursing homes and sign people up right there to vote. They register them to vote, and we vote them right there in front of them. We need a sea of locusts approach. This is something that Lee Havis from Prince George's County has been talking about. I know Lee is here in the room as well, and he's got some handouts. Talk to him later on. It's a, we need to have thousands of volunteers, not hundreds. We need moms out in the streets climbing with pots and pans, okay? We need to make noise, uh, and we need to have children out there with giant credit cards on them, maxed out because the government took my money. We need a positive me uh, me message of change, okay? This is what Ronald Reagan had, and it works. For example, in the, in the Maryland General Assembly, we have to start with trench warfare. We lose every time because we don't have the votes. So why not change this? Why don't we just call in our strategic bombers and hit their cities, hit their core beliefs? Here are a few ideas I picked up uh, from, from Lee uh, earlier on. A positive agenda in the legislature. Why not a right to work bill? Bill to fund the return to optical scanners or paper ballots. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you work for the government, you've got to take a drug test, right, to be able to get your clearance. And, well, so, so you can pay taxes, you pay a drug, drug test. Why not a bill that would condition welfare payments to accept your tax? Why not a bill that declares English as the official language? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not a bill that reserves tuition benefits to American citizens and legal residents. And Jim, why not a voter ID bill? Yeah. Look, it doesn't matter if these measures fail. We force them to engage, and perhaps we also capture the imagination of the public. We need to study the great popular movements of history and adopt them to today. Today, so please. Talk to Lee Havis. Have him come to your central committees. He's handing out flyers on this. We've got to talk to our neighbors, to our PTAs, even if you don't like them. Uh, we have to talk to our kids. We have to deprogramming the brainwashing that we see every day at the government schools. I haven't done enough of this in my own family, with my own neighbors, in my own community. Have you done enough in yours?
could you just stand up for a second so people can identify you? Who's talking to you? Thank you, Kevin. All right, and our last and final speaker is Neil Parrott. And uh, born in Bethesda, Maryland, Neil graduated from the University of Maryland College Park with a BS in civil engineering and from Mount St. Mary's University with an MBA. In 2010, he was elected to the Maryland House of Delegates as a Republican delegate representing Washington County and currently serves on the House Judiciary Committee. As a founder of the MDPetitions.com, Delegate Parrott was the architect of efforts to help put referenda on the November 2012 ballot to overturn same-sex marriage, in-state tuition for illegal aliens, and congressional redistricting maps that are I'll call the most gerrymandered in the entire nation. Delegate Parrott is a stalwart conservative leader in Annapolis who was named the Republican Man of the Year. He is an Eagle Scout, a member of the Hagerstown Rotary Club, and a devoted husband and father of three beautiful children. It's a real honor and a privilege to be able to talk to you today. Um, you can tell my voice is a little bit gone, so you have to be quiet. <laughs> I apologize for that. I'm not sick, but I was sick a week ago, and now it's here. Um, I want to thank you. Every single person here in this room has made the success that Marilyn saw this last year for the first time in 20 years. And how ridiculous is that? 20 years without any referendums in Maryland because of the effort of everybody in this room, the people like you all across the state, who went to mbpetitions.com, downloaded the form, signed it, yes. mailed it in, made copies, took it to your work, to your places of worship, you took it to your family members, and you got the signatures, you sent them in, and we succeeded on getting three ballot referendums on the ballot this last year. I want to thank and congratulate each one of you for the hard work it paid off we won by getting it on the ballot this last year's. Now, one thing that um, Dan Bongino, I just want to follow up. I loved your talk. Ken, I loved your talk. You know, we have so many good speakers here on today. I want to thank Kathy Petrunek for putting, and everybody who organized this together. What an awesome time. This is the third one that we can get together and strategize as a group and say, how are we going to move forward? How are we going to take conservative principles? How are we going to win as we move forward? And Dan, he talked about an idea, it's, it's reminds you of a quote from Morton Blackwell. He said, actions have consequences. You know, it's interesting, it was a takeoff of another quote, where they say ideas have consequences, when actually ideas have no consequences at all. <laughs> an idea could be a good idea inside your brain, and that's wonderful, but unless we take action on that idea, then it doesn't mean anything at all. Dan challenged each one of us, hey, we've got to get more people enrolled to vote, who are on without persuasion. And I love what you're going to do in Frederick. There's a big gun show. I mean, beautiful. That's what we've got to do. We've got to use our imaginations throughout the state. We all have different talents. And we can take those talents and we can work to make sure that we win issues. You know, we work together with IndyPetitions.com. We're going to go through just very briefly how we were successful. And then also how in the long run, you know, at the very end, we, we didn't quite get it. We didn't win those on the ballot. But you know, someone told me it's like riding a bike. You get up on a bike, you ride it, you fall down, you say, okay, I fell down, what happens? What can we do differently next time? How can we keep going on that bike? And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. All right, so very quickly, I want to go through the steps of the referendum effort. One, uh, they pass a bad bill. So then we have to do something about it. The very first thing we have to do is get language approved by the Board of Elections. They run it through the Attorney General's office, we get this, this language that's gonna be on a referendum petition. Then once we have that, we go out and we work together. We get the signatures. We have until May 31st to get the first third of the signatures. We have until June 30th to get the remainder of the signatures and turn them in. You know, we've gotta be well over the number that's gonna kick it out. After we get the signatures, we gotta defend our signatures in court. I mean. They go, the opposition, whoever the opposition has to be, whether it happens to be, whether it's the Maryland Democrat Party, can you believe it, trying to shut down the people in Maryland to be able to, to vote on an issue? But that's what they did with question number five. They were embarrassed by that map, and they should be. Comedy Central said nothing, 
basically, they made fun of our man. Maryland's mad on Comedy Central. Um, and they did. It's because our map was terrible. They were embarrassed. They didn't want us to have the opportunity to vote on that map. They tried everything they could to shut it down. Basically, they tried to throw out the signatures. Passage of Maryland, they didn't put a question for on the ballot. That was their first step, too. Hey, let's throw out these signatures. They both lost, thankfully. Uh, judicial Watch, who was here with Tom Fitton earlier. I don't know if he's still here. Tom, are you here? Anyway, thank you, Tom. phenomenal job defending those signatures to make sure that everybody in Maryland would be able to vote on something that we all worked so hard to get on that ballot. Um, so then after we defend the signatures, then the real language comes forward. So this September, they decided on language. It's the um, Secretary of State, basically the Attorney General's office again, works up the, the language, they give it to the Secretary of State who approves it and says, oh look, here by the way is the language. Did anybody understand question number five by just reading it? I mean, it sounded like, if you support the U.S. Constitution, right. vote yes. If you don't, vote no. I mean, it was ridiculous, and yet, you know, Judicial Watch helped us again. We sued over the language. I still don't understand why we lost, except for I do understand. What we started to do is we just went a little bit too far. The, this Court of Appeals of Maryland said, you know what, we're all appointed here by Democrats, and uh, you're upsetting the Democrat machine here, and we're not going to let you do it. We're not changing the language. You know, enough is enough. So they weren't fair. I don't believe in that decision because we did. You just watch it. It's good homework. We had some great precedent cases that said we should have won, but we didn't. And that's okay because we can overcome these things. Um, we didn't this year, but we can in the future, and that's what I want to talk about. So basically, we have that language. After the language comes a campaign, and then after the campaign comes the voting. Um, the one part I think that we can do better is the campaign. Uh, we were prepared, NBPetitions.com, as you can tell by the name, is to get a petition and allow us to vote on something, which we were successful in. But we were not prepared to do a campaign. If we look at question number four, Casa de Maryland, who, you know, they get our tax money, they get tax money from the state, they get it from Montgomery County, they get it from the federal government. They spent $1.7 million and a campaign to make sure that question four was approved. That basically we would give our hard-earned uh, tax dollars to illegal aliens and basically pay for two-thirds of their college education. And just like Tom said earlier, when they graduate, they can't vote. I mean, they can't work. They can't work legally in this state. And yet we're paying for their education. You know, especially that white collar job. It's, it's not fair to Marylanders, and it's not fair to the illegal alien. They're probably still taking loans, and they're going to graduate and say, oh good, let me go work for Ernst Young now. Oh, let me go work for the Department of Defense. Well, you know what? You can just forget it. Because these white collar jobs are not going to be able to afford the lawsuits against them if they hire an illegal alien. Can you imagine an auditor who's an illegal alien auditing some companies? I don't think so. They can't afford that. That's a huge lawsuit just waiting to happen. Uh, it's deceptive and it's wrong and bad policy. And we knew that. That's why we went out and we got the signatures. The problem was, they had $1.7 million, and all told, we spent about $60,000 on the campaign. I'll tell you, I spent some of my own money. We did everything we could to try and get the message out, especially as it came towards the end. I saw what was happening. Our message just wasn't out there. Um, and there were other organizations, too, that I'm not going to name, but other organizations who didn't even report, but, I, but the work they did, they spent over $500,000. Um, it, it just goes on and on. All right. Carrie, tell me I have one minute. Let's get started. <laughs> I tell you what, here's what needs to happen. We need to reinvent NBPetitions.com. It's not enough just to get it on the ballot. We have to have a campaign. And the campaign is going to consist not just, I mean, we've got to have money. You know, another Morton Blackwell quote is you can't beat somebody with nobody, which means you can't, you know, you have to have a good candidate in order to beat somebody. Um, but we also have to have a campaign. You can't win if they have a campaign and we don't. You know, what they did successfully on question four was they changed the whole question. It wasn't about, are we gonna give our hard-earned money to illegal aliens when they graduate, they can't even get a job? It was about, oh, these poor people. You know, they're here, they're in our schools, we should just let them And you know, we couldn't come back and say, that's not even the issue. That's not what we're talking about. Um, so we've gotta have that campaign. Um, here, very, very briefly. The first step is we've got to stop the bad bill first. And we have a chance. This right now in Annapolis, they've got a lot of bad bills. 
and then we're going to get them passed. And we're going to reach out. And anybody who's on the mdpetitions.com uh, email chain, they're going to get emails as we go forward and say, hey, they're about to eliminate the death penalty, or they're about to do this or that. And when that happens, we've got to have some action. People have got to write or call their delegates. You know, it doesn't take a lot of pressure for some of these delegates just to buckle and say, hey, forget it. I'm out of this. I don't care. I'm not voting for this thing. They're going to get pressure from the leadership. I can guarantee you that. I mean, I've seen delegates leave meetings in tears. Delegate Kippy has too. Um, you know, really, in tears because the governor called him in or the governor's wife and said, you do this or we're going to do this thing to you. I mean, I could, the, the stories are just horrible. Wow. But we can beat them. If they feel enough pressure from the people, they're not going to vote the wrong way. So that's first. Let's try and stop that bill. And then we're going to have to continue to get these things on the ballot. If they pass some of this horrendous again, we're going to have to get on the ballot. But we've got to plan now all the way through the campaign. So you're going to see mdpetitions.com shift a little bit of its focus. Because we're going to have to have those resources. Now, it's not just money. We have to have money. We have to have commercials and things. But we also have to have that ground game where people in every county, I've got to have county coordinators. Uh, we've got to be able to say, all right, here's the information. It's got to get out. You know, somebody talked to me just the other day about what the Christian coalition did. They said, you know, within two hours, they covered all the, all the voters in Baltimore County with a flyer. Boom, big voter guy. You know, we've got to be able to do that. If we do that with volunteers throughout the state, our costs are going to come way down. We don't need to spend the $1.7 million. Well, we've got to spend probably at least 250000 and we've got to have a network of volunteers all across the state who are going to work in a coordinated effort. We can beat these guys. And we can do it together. So let's let's do it together. Let's get involved. Um, and let's just keep on going because we can do it. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think this is just the beginning of a great day in Maryland. Thank you very much. So the microphone is in the middle. Uh, please line up and keep your questions very brief to the point so that we can get everybody in. Thank you. I tried to get a bill passed through uh, Nancy Jacobs to give us privacy when we sign a petition. We were there at the hearing. We can sue to stop the release of that information if it's not for the good of the public. That is part of the Information Act. However, I don't believe we did that. Will we do that in the future to prevent my name from being released and everybody in this room who signed a petition, their name to be released to the opposition and their address, et cetera? Well, first, that's a great question. Nancy Jacobs introduced that bill in the Senate last year, and I introduced the same bill in the House. We tried to get that bill passed, but we saw that it would lead to problems. Uh, this year, thankfully, in the House, uh, there's a Democrat from Baltimore City was introducing the same bill. And uh, I fully support her in that effort. Uh, hopefully, we can see that bill be passed. It's important. You know, this year, I mean, this is just embarrassing. Angela McCusco, if anyone knows, she's the first deaf African-American female to graduate from Gallaudet University. She graduated, and she's had a successful career at Gallaudet University. And she was, uh, at the time, my, uh, the minority officer. She signed a petition simply to allow us to vote on the same-sex marriage bill. They took her immediately, put her on leave, and said, hey, you're, you're out of here. Now, I don't know what's happened to her. I've heard they made for you to stay here. But you know what? That's a the point. Yeah. They embarrassed her and took her out of a job for about four or five months. And the only reason she got a job back was because everybody was ashamed. You know what? The only real reason is that it was an election year and it was on the ballot. Had it not been on the ballot, you wouldn't have seen a lot of people come out and say, oh, well, you can't do that. They'd be like, great, yeah, get rid of her. There's no reason to have a minority officer here who doesn't represent our values to a T. So you're right in that these things have got to be, they've got to be protected. Now, is that bill going to pass? I don't know. I'm glad to see that we have Democrats support this year. Now, if we took it to court and said, we don't think it's a public benefit to release these signatures, Unfortunately, we would have lost. We talked to legal counsel about that. We, we would have lost that case. You know, it may have delayed it a little bit, but that, the way to go is we've got to get this in legislation. And that's one thing I'm going to reach out to everybody here is to talk to your delegates and say, hey, this is one bill we've got to see passed this year. It's a great question. Thank you. Thank you all so much. 
My name is Tyler O'Neill. I'm a freelance writer for the Washington Free Beacon, and also I worked on the Romney campaign in Colorado Springs. Uh, I really have two questions. You talk a lot about organization, and that's great, but you'll see all over the Beacon, the Democracy Alliance and the Democracy Initiative on the progressive side are continually bringing these organizations together and creating a huge block, much like we saw in Colorado with the Gang of Four, which turned a red state that had been my home, for, which had, had been a red state for you know so many years, upwards of 50, and that automatically switches to blue because they spend money and have this organization. And you also talked about voter contact, brown green. What about Get Out the Vote and Project Work? Because those were the things that suffered most, I think, on the Romney campaign, and I saw in Colorado Springs uh, a huge failing there because it hadn't been means tested. What sort of initiatives for organization and for planning for the ground game for the end do you guys have on the team? Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> what are we doing? Again, not what are we talking about, right? Well, I'll give you two strategies right now. If you're not getting emails, you're lost. Right. You can talk to everybody in this room. I get, matter of fact, I met well, Larry Hominiak introduced me to a, a nice young man a few minutes ago. He said, I want to volunteer. I took out my constant contact app and said, give me your email right now. He's now my volunteer right. whether he knows it or not. Right. You have a voter contact and you right. do not get the email. You've lost. Facebook and social media are terrific, right. Right. but the action items you were asking for people for work better via email than Facebook or social media. Yes. In other words, if I'm asking you for money, if I'm asking you to show up for a door knock, I have a better chance of getting you through email than I do through Facebook yes. or social media. Do not over-rely on that. Secondly, Facebook and social media do have a value to get your email. If you follow me on Facebook, you know, folks, we have the second biggest audience in Maryland, past Bob Earl. It's not because of my good looks or my wife would probably dispute that. But listen, I got too many scars and that's not it. We had a very active material outreach policy on Facebook and social media. What are you doing on Facebook to target people with big audiences whose spheres of influence are larger than yours? What are you doing to reach out to Anne Marie Morell, like Joanne Wilkerson on my campaign did, and got her to post one of my red state blogs, which led to 400 new Facebook likes? Anyone? On Twitter, are you micro listening, as the Obama campaign says? In other words, if you're on Twitter, if you're not, you're already lost. But if you're on Twitter, what are you doing on Twitter? Are you putting your name, not your handle, that'll come up automatically. Are you putting your name in the discovery box and finding out who's talking about you? Are you then tweeting back like I do? Go to my Twitter account. Look at the, look at the conversations I had with the, an anti-school choice character. There's about 50 or 60 back and forth. Read it. Read all the people that read what we wrote and all the followers we got. School Choice Week, who we then thanked for following and told other people to follow. You know, what are you doing to do that? To get That's how you do it, folks. It's not always about micro-targeting. The Obama campaign, brilliantly, I might add, you may not like their politics, God knows I don't, but you better respect their operations, because if you don't, you're going to lose again. They put their name in there, and they reached out to every single person. Sometimes you have to take you know, the cotton out of your ears and stick it in your mouth, and you have to listen. And we did that effectively. This is, we lost, folks. There's no silver medals in politics. But I'll be honest with you. We didn't have a dime. We raised $2 million, of which 1.8 came in in the last two months. We didn't have nothing. We didn't have zero until the end. And we managed to hold on to the entire Republican base in Maryland. We, def we were outspent 20 to 1. But we did it because we had a strategy. Those are some things going forward, and if you want to talk to me afterwards, I can give you 20 or 30 more. But it works, I promise you. Ken, I heard you go through a list of uh, bills that you wanted to introduce right, right to work through all these school choices and all those bills. Now, I make my business to know what is put in the General Assembly, and all those bills are regularly introduced. Unfortunately, they never make it out of committee. And this may actually be something Neil could actually elaborate on. Is there a way to get around committee. I see the thing that you have to have a third of the General Assembly petition around it, and we don't have a third lead of body, so. 
A, is that true? And B, how do we work on getting over one third? We got a lot more conservatives in the General Assembly to get around that roadblock that the committee chairs put on us. That's a great question. And you've hit on something that's part of the Maryland Constitution that hardly anyone knows. Um, yes, the committee system is extremely powerful, and yes, they vary almost every good bill. Um, there's not even voted on a committee, it just goes in the drawer, goes away, like it never even happens. Uh, but if you do get a third of the people, I believe it's a third, uh, of the General Assembly members, you can petition it to the floor. Now, a lot of people say, oh, well, that's not um, decor. That breaks the quorum. You don't want to do that. So a lot of people are pressured not to sign that petition. Yeah, it's focus on this thing. But um, there were actually a couple times when that rule was almost used. Um, well, Doug and Don Dwyer had, had that done. He actually had the names um, for a couple bills that were really good. Although at the time, it wasn't prudent at that, to go ahead and bring it forward to the floor. Um, the second time. The first time he actually had the bills, uh, Mike Bush found out what was going on just in the nick of time because all the press was there. They had called the press and said, hey, we're going to do this. Uh, and right when he realized what was happening, he did something that he's never done. Uh, they took the Pledge of Allegiance, and then boom, gaveled, were dismissed, and they were done. And so when that happened, uh, one of the people who were on that list, Mike Bush, Speaker of the House, pressured and said, get your name off that list right now, or you're going to face some serious consequences. He got his name off the list, and that was the end of that. Um, but that is a tool that can be used. It hasn't been used. I don't know. I don't know if it's ever been used. But but it is a tool that's possible. Uh, we do need to get some more friendlies on the dele in the delegation, so that we can actually use that more often in the future. Uh, one question about, especially with on-air media during this fall campaign, it seemed like the three questions that we put on. And even maybe to some extent the candidate campaigns were so overwhelmed by all the paid advertising for and against casino gambling, all we heard was question seven, question seven, question seven. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on what impact that had on our campaigns and how you would operate in the future in that kind of environment. Well, I do. Thank you. Great question. I'll tell you what, question seven, if you look at the for or the against side, the amount of money that was spent for Governor O'Malley and Governor Ehrlich, the whole thing, was outspent by one side or the other on question seven. I mean, easily outspent. So they outspent, and just imagine, that those, those numbers are astronomical. Talk about sucking the oxygen out of the room. Question seven did that. There was no room for anything else to come forward. Now, if we look at question four, like I said, cast them around, they spent $1.7 million, and that was effective money because they changed the whole debate. Um, so there was still room to come in and make arguments. But as far as us grassroots controlling the debate by even calling in to talk radio, it just didn't work. It didn't work because we were, question seven, with that much money being spent, we were being drowned out. Uh, and the only message that they heard were the, the serious money that, especially if you went to vote on election day, you saw a lot of flyers out there that they were passing out said, uh, moving Maryland forward, vote yes, or one through seven. And people, right. Oh, and those people, just so you know, they were not there volunteering. They were paid. Paid volunteers. <laughs> okay, it's two o'clock right now. Um, but please come up and you know ask ask your the speakers, the wonderful speakers, your questions afterwards. Um, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer anything you have to bring forward. Um, it's two o'clock up right now. After the next panel, because we are pressed for time. So sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions, but thank you, everybody.